I'd like to thank uh, once again WSH2 Public Radio for sponsoring our community conversation. And last but not least, I would love to thank our wonderful panelists, Kika Matos, Attorney General Tong, Chris George, and Daniela Carranza for making this event possible. As a reminder, our panelists will have about 40 minutes to speak, and thereafter we will open it up for Q&A. So up first is Kika Matos. Kika is a board member at IRIS and is the vice president of initiatives at the Vera Institute for Justice. Before joining Vera, Kika has worked at the Center for Community Change, the City of New Haven, Junta, and many other amazing organizations. She has been a national advocate for immigration reform and has extensive experience as a community organizer and a lawyer. Take it away, Kika. Thank you so much, Tabitha, and I apologize for the pause. I was trying to, uh, to get unmuted. and has all the power in this call, so I had to ask her to unmute me. Uh, I'm really happy to be with all of you this afternoon, I'm talking about an issue that um, I fight against uh, each and every day, and that is the criminalization of um, immigrants. And I want to start off by making an observation, uh, and that is uh, that we as a nation have a really bad track record when it comes to mass incarceration and criminalizing people. Um, we have the worst record in the entire world when it comes to mass incarceration. Uh, today, we have approximately 2.3 million people behind bars. Uh, this includes an estimated 50,000 immigrants on any given day who are detained in the roughly 218 immigration detention centers that we have around the country. And immigration detention centers is really a euphemism uh, for what they are, which is jails. Um, what is immigration detention? It's the unjust and inhumane practice that we use while immigrants uh, wait a government decision about their status or their potential deportation. Uh, to put it as simply as possible, let me say this, we criminalize people. We arrest them, we lock them up, and we take away their liberties for no other reason than their immigration status. Who are the immigrants that we criminalize? They are both documented and undocumented. They include people whose immigration status is either not current, has expired, or is under review. We also criminalize people who are seeking asylum. Uh, once in detention, detention, immigrants are not only deprived of their liberty, but they're also separated from their families and loved ones, and often subject to really horrible conditions. Uh, last year alone, 21 immigrants died while in detention. Um, I actually visited a few detention centers because of my job uh, prior to COVID-19. I went to a detention center in uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey, and I went to one uh, in California. Uh, and what I can tell you as somebody who used to represent people on death row is that these detention centers are actually no different than the prisons I've been to. And in fact, one of the detention centers reminded me of death row in Pennsylvania. These are um, places where immigrants uh, wear orange jumpsuits. They're confined to these settings. They're behind bars and they're under this close supervision and authority of guards. Uh, so that's a really quick picture of, um, of, of how we um, treat our immigrants. We criminalize, um, uh, our solution is to criminalize them. And you're probably wondering how we got here. When did we start, why, and what is the way forward? Uh, let me quickly point to three significant moments in our nation's history, given um, that I only have uh, a few minutes to speak. Um, the first uh, fr framing of the criminalization of immigrants really happened in 1980. Uh, and at the time, the US was really confronted with a refugee crisis implicating both uh, Cubans and Haitians. Uh, more than 100,000 Cubans arrived as a result of the Mariel uh, boat lift. And in addition, 15,000 Haitians came fleeing the terrible political situation in their country. And what the Carter administration did in response was to set up a bunch of detention camps uh, to hold those coming into our shores while they were being processed. And what ended up happening is that most Cubans who were detained were soon free to join families and relatives, but may, many Haitian asylees who had no uh, connections in the US um, uh, were kept in detention. Um, and as the uh, Haitian refugee crisis worsened one year later and under a new administration, the Reagan administration, they actually embraced detention as a tool in part to deter others 
And so starting in May of that year, immigration officials actually began to detain every single Haitian and uh, denied them bond. And so really that was the beginning of detention being a new immigration policy. Um, and this was the beginning of the pattern of undocumented immigrants being treated as a criminal threat and deserving of this type of punishment. Uh, the Chrome Detention Center in Miami was the first detention center, and this served as a model for the types of detention centers that we see uh, in the country today. Uh, the second key moment happened in 1996 when Congress passed two terrible laws, um, EDPA uh, and the Illegal Immigration Reform and, and, Immigration, and Immigrant Responsibility Act, and this really expanded the range of who could be subject to mandatory detention. Uh, these laws made any non-US citizen, including legal permanent residents, vulnerable to detention and deportation. Uh, the third key moment, uh, and this will be familiar to all of you, it happened in the aftermath of the September 11 attacks. Um, uh, the Department of Homeland Security was created, ICE was created, and ICE was put under the jurisdiction of DHS. And it was really during this period that immigration began to be framed um, as a national security issue. Uh, and DHS and ICE began to advance a pretty hardcore enforcement mindset. Uh, let me quote language from an office that was created called the Office of Detention and Removal, um, whose goal was, quote, we must endeavor to maintain the integrity of the immigration process and protect our homeland by ensuring that every alien who is ordered removed and can be departs the United States as quickly as possible and as effective as practicable. As practicable. We must strive for 100% removal rate. So that's the framework that we have been operating on under the over the last two decades, one that focuses on enforcement and has normalized the criminalization of immigrants and demonized them in the process. Every single president, both Republican and Democrat since then has embraced this framework. Uh, we know Obama wrapped up in uh, enforcement under his presidency and he deported more people than any other president. Um, and he did it through three particular programs, including the 287G program, which was really the beginning of collaboration between the federal government and the local government around enforcement. And that really brought local law enforcement into what was always a federal practice of enforcement around immigration. Uh, in 2014, we saw even more uh, deportations around the family crisis in the border. And then boom, came the Trump administration. And what we saw was a parade of, of horribles and they took things a step further. Um, they expanded the deportation dragnet even more. They increased the number of 287G agreements. They advanced over 400 anti-immigrant executive orders. And one of them that was particularly troubling was making anybody and everybody undocumented subject to deportation. Um, finally, the zero tolerance policy at the border led to family separation crisis where, where parents were um, arrested and kids were put in detention centers. Um, add this to the, I'm sorry, let me just turn this off. Um, add this to the local practice that we have had also of um, local laws that have been passed uh, that have been anti-immigrant, and that is what we have today. Uh, let me quickly contextualize this with numbers. The average daily population of detained immigrants in 1994 was 7,000. The average daily number in 2001 was 19,000. Uh, and two years ago, the average daily number of people in detention was 50,000. In 2019, 500,000 immigrants were detained. Um, uh, undergirding all of this is racial bias is not an accident that black immigrants have been over targeted uh, and that the criminalization of immigrants has really been framed in the context of black and brown people being a danger and a threat to our country. Uh, so what's the way forward? What do we do? Let me end with just a few quick thoughts. Um, the first is I just want to note that the criminalization of immigrants is a tool that is carefully uh, used uh, and engineered to dehumanize immigrant communities. I'm sure the attorney general uh, will speak to this because he's the one that we often turn to to ask for support in, partic in particular cases where we see uh, injustice playing out. Um, the handcuffs, the cop cars, the bars, the jumpsuits, the prisons, these are all mechanisms that are intended to strip immigrants of their humanity and create an us versus them dynamic. We have to eliminate detention. 
We have no justifiable reason for a detention system. We have better alternatives and we've done a ton of research in Vera to prove that. And the second is we have to make sure that every single person in detention or every single person facing deportation proceedings has access to justice. And by that, I mean, they should have lawyers. Uh, we've been working with IRIS and again, we at Viera have a, a, an advocacy agenda to really make sure that every single immigrant facing deportation is represented by a good, zealous lawyer. Uh, and finally, let me just say that we have to push for changes in the law at the federal level. The last time we, this country actually passed a pretty serious in-depth federal immigration laws was in 1996, that was 25 years ago. So we need to come together, chop, chop, and move to change immigration laws. And with that, I will stop and turn it over to Tabitha. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kika, for sharing. So next up is Attorney General Tong. He is the first Asian American general attorney of the state of Connecticut. Before this, he served as a state representative in the Connecticut General Assembly for 12 years. Go ahead, Attorney General Tong. Thank you, Tabitha. And um, I think I should just say what Kika said. Um, I agree with all of that. Done. End of story. No, thank you, um, Iris and WSHU and um, all of you for joining us here today. And Kika, thank you for, for teeing that up. And um, I really appreciate you um, concluding our remarks about the dehumanization of human beings, right? People who need our help and the role that race and hate and discrimination plays in all of this. And I think we would be remiss by not acknowledging what a horrible week it's been for us as Americans. We get to relive the murder of George Floyd every minute on cable television right now as we speak during the trial. And just this week, two horrific videos of beatings in New York City of Asian Americans um, after the murder of eight people in Atlanta, Georgia, and the targeting and murder of six Asian American women, um, who I, I believe were were all um, immigrants or recent immigrants. And I think that we also need to acknowledge that this increase in hate and hate crimes and bias and the fact that hate and extremism is now, according to federal law enforcement and the FBI and the Department of Justice, the number one domestic terror threat in this country, we have to acknowledge the role that President Trump played in that when he declared war on America's immigrants and how that fueled uh, and gave license to people to hate, to hate openly and to act out on their hate. And when hate became in many respects, the official policy of the United States of America. And I think we need to acknowledge that. And, and what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is when you declare war on America's immigrants, and I think people thought that when President Trump was talking about America's, uh, was talking about immigrants and so-called bad hombres, right? He was not just dog whistling, he was being overtly racist. And, and it appeared to many people that he was talking about people on the Southern border, people from Mexico or Latin America or Hispanic or Latinx descent. But he's talking about everybody. And, and when he said he wanted to denaturalize American citizens, immigrants who came here, earn their citizenship, it very quickly occurred to me that he was talking about my parents and my grandparents. And then when he and many of his allies attacked the American-born, native-born children of immigrants and called them anchor babies and talked about denying their citizenship, he was talking about me. And I think all of us should acknowledge that when he declared war on America's immigrants, that he declared war on many people and many families across Connecticut and across this country like mine. And in doing so, he made us unsafe. And he put us at risk because now people dehumanize us. They otherize us. They see us as part of the problem. When I'm as American as anybody else. And, and, and so is my family and their citizenship was earned through 
blood, sweat, tears, sacrifice, um, and, and the same sacrifices that people go through every day at many of these detention centers, Kika, and at our southern border. The other thing that, that um, was jarring to me, Kika, is when you began your discussion about mass incarceration. And what's been really hard for me is in this moment when Asian Americans are being attacked and targeted, people, allies, say to me, well, I can't believe this is happening. How could this be happening? And when the separation policy was implemented by President Trump, people would say, I can't believe our country is capable of such cruelty to separate children from their families. And I have to remind people, I can believe it. Because it wasn't just in the 80s, Kika, as you know. We separated families. We separated children from their families. We put American citizens in camps on American soil and we scapegoated them. We blamed them. We said they're responsible for Pearl Harbor and World War II. We put 125,000 Japanese American citizens in camps on American soil. You wanna talk about mass incarceration and a policy based on racism and hate and immigrants, you don't have to look any further than that. And that didn't happen in the 80s. That happened over 75 years ago. And our community, by the way, also suffered the Chinese Exclusion Act, which until 1967 was the official policy of this country not to allow Chinese to immigrate to this country. And so I think the way forward must include reckoning with that history and not expressing surprise or not seeing it as something new or recent development, uh, but something that in order for us to address it, um, recognize how long we've, we've, we've adopted some of these practices, right? Or used these practices um, and, and how it visits upon us every day here in Connecticut. And so uh, I do wanna talk about our work here in Connecticut and, and protecting immigrants and the way that these policies affect us. And Kika, you mentioned that um, there's a bat phone that you and others call <laughs> uh when somebody's under attack in um, our state and i'm often on the other end of the bat phone and um you know hardly um uh, you know a, a week or month goes by without us hearing about somebody um who's been targeted by ice and who is at risk of being deported and uh, you know one of the really important fights um, that, that we've undertaken is the defense of two immigrants here in Connecticut, Wazara Walton and Richard Thompson. And I think many of you know their story, but their stories very quickly are symptomatic of what's wrong with our system. Both of them came to this country as young people. Wazara came, I think, when she was four years old. She from England. Richard Thompson uh, uh, immigrated here, I think, as a as a young man, um, and 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 both, you know, have lived most of their lives in this country and and don't have anybody back home, okay, um, and uh, both were arrested and and prosecuted uh, for crimes years and years ago, and. Um, in the case of Wizara Walton, it was for really low level um, larceny offenses. She stole stuff from um, Babies R Us, I think, to, to care for her child. Uh, Richard Thompson got into a bar fight and, um, and he was a very young man when he did that. Uh, and um, both of them otherwise, after those incidents got their lives together and you know, they're working people and, and they have families and they're not unlike the rest of us. Uh, and then they both sought pardons uh, from the Board of Pardons and Paroles from the state of Connecticut and they were granted those pardons. But under uh, President Trump, ICE and um, uh, the, the Department of Justice decided that they were not gonna recognize those pardons. And what they decided was under the Immigration and Nationality Act, 
the federal government can deport people for serious felonies unless they've been pardoned. Now we can have an argument about whether those were serious felonies or not, but let's assume for the second that they qualified under the uh, INA, um, the federal government moved to deport them even though they'd been pardoned by the state of Connecticut. And the um, Trump Justice Department and ICE targeted Connecticut um, and treated us unlike any other state in the country in, in denying the legal effectiveness of our pardon. So we went to court, took on um, um, the, the Department of Justice and the Trump administration. I'm glad to say that um, we've won so far and that um, Ms. Walton and Mr. Thompson are here in this country still. The fight's not over. Um, I think last week or the week before, time has blurred together as it has for everybody during COVID. Uh, the Biden administration said that it would voluntarily recognize the efficacy of Connecticut pardons under the pardon waiver clause of the INA. We appreciate that gesture, not good enough. Um, so we're still litigating and want to make sure that going forward, anyone who's been pardoned, any immigrant who's been pardoned by the state of Connecticut for a serious felony cannot be deported for that serious felony. So that's an example of the type of work that we do. I've worked with many people on this call on those specific cases and on many others. Um, it, it, very often there's no guidebook or rule book on how to do this and protect people. And, and for now we're doing it one person at a time, one family at a time until Congress can get its act together and pass comprehensive immigration reform. So thank you for having me here today. Thank you, Attorney General Tong. We really appreciate you being here and for sharing. All right, so we now have, uh, next up is Chris George. And Chris George is the Executive Director of IRIS. He has been the Executive Director of IRIS for almost 16 years. He has spent the majority of his professional life living and working in the Middle East. And yes, he does speak Arabic, in case you're wondering. He has worked for Human Rights Watch, USAID, the American Friends Service Committee, and was a Peace Corps volunteer in Oman. You're up, Chris. Great. Well, uh, once again, thank you, uh, Kika Matos and Attorney General Tong for joining us. Um, I am just going to answer the question. So. What can IRIS do about all this? Um, most people know that we have uh, been for many, many years, almost exclusively a refugee resettlement agency, uh, welcoming refugees who've been selected by the State Department, vetted by Homeland Security overseas, and then invited to come to the United States. Our job has been to, to welcome them and help them get off to a new start. Uh, but over the past, several years, we have expanded our services and opened our doors to other immigrants in the community. Not only refugees, but those who are trying to get refugee status. We call that applying for asylum. And other immigrants, including undocumented immigrants who need our help, especially during a pandemic. So that's one thing that we've been doing is extending our services to the broader immigrant community, asylum seekers, and other undocumented immigrants. But what else can we do specifically to help families that are waiting for their asylum cases to be held? They should not be detained. They should not be criminalized and locked up. They should be placed with friends or relatives somewhere in the United States and connected to, and this is where Iris comes in, connected to a social service organization like a refugee resettlement agency. This is not my idea. This has been done in the past. In fact, under the Obama administration, there was a very successful program, an alternative to incarceration called Family Case Management Program. Back then it was managed by a prison contractor, which is not exactly the best place to go to for social services. It should be managed by organizations like ours. So that's one thing that can be done. Individuals and families released from incarceration while they're waiting for their asylum cases to be adjudicated, placed with 
friends or relatives and assign to a social service organization like IRIS. We can find them an attorney. If they have an attorney, when they're applying for asylum, they are 10 times more likely to win their case. And some of you might be surprised to hear that when someone is being deported, an immigrant is being deported and goes before an immigration judge, they are not granted a public defender. No, that's in criminal court. In, in immigration court, they have to stand up and face that immigration judge and attorneys from the Department of Homeland Security all by themselves, unless an organization has stepped forward to provide them with an attorney or unless they have the money to hire an attorney. So that's another thing that IRIS has been doing. We've in New Haven with New Haven Legal Aid Association to provide representation to immigrants who are facing deportation. And when someone is deported to a country that they have fled because of persecution, they could be killed. So it is often, a, the consequence of being deported is often deadly. All the more reason why they should have court representation. Um, so the other thing that we are doing, offering to provide case management and support for families waiting um, uh, deportation, uh, oh, sorry, waiting for their asylum cases to be adjudicated, providing actual attorneys and case managers to work with the families of people who are in deportation hearings. Like everything else we do at IRIS, we can also involve Americans in this work and provide opportunities to educate Americans like this, like this talk that's going on now. Um, there is no sense in providing these services uh, under the radar, quietly or in the shadows. Uh, it is essential that as many Americans as possible understand that immigrants are not criminals, understand the refugee resettlement program, understand the asylum process, and actually get to know immigrants. Studies show you get to know immigrants, you will support immigration reform. And we need desperately, as Attorney General Tong reminded us, reminded us comprehensive immigration reform. So that's all I'm gonna say for now. Uh, you might see me back again when uh, we're answering questions. So back to you, Tabitha. Thank you, Chris. Next, we have Daniela Carranza. And Daniela is a case manager at IRIS and works directly with undocumented and asylum seeking community members. Born and raised in New Haven, she is a strong community advocate and fights for the rights of her community her friends and her family and her clients. She's also a mom and is a student at Gateway. Thank you for the intro, Tabitha. And thank you for everyone who's here today. Um, yes, I'm a case manager at IRIS under the SUN program, Services for Undocumented Neighbors. We are a team of three case managers at IRIS who work to provide these social services for undocumented members in, of the New Haven community. community. Um, I've been working at IRIS since June 2020, um, but I've been involved in this type of work since 2019, uh, September 2019. Um, this issue of the criminalization of immigrants affects me personally, uh, which is what got me into this work. The passion that I have to help those who are victims of this inhumane immigration system. Um, I, it's, I'm, I'm very passionate about uh, this work. <laughs> um, my partner of five years and the father of my two children who is a hard worker, provider, provider, thoughtful husband, <laughs> loving parent, uh, who came to the US fleeing violence by himself at the age of 17, uh, had also been labeled a criminal by this cruel system. The way the laws are right now, even though we are married, it is an extremely difficult process with a high risk of deportation if we try to get him legal status. Um, and I live every single day knowing that the love of my life and the father of my children could be separated from us and deported. Although seeking asylum is not a crime, and in fact, it, it is the US's ob legal obligation to allow people to seek asylum, our clients are made into criminals by the immigration system the very moment they arrive into the country. And, and having a one year timeline to apply for asylum is not sufficient. Many people are not aware 
or they can't afford a lawyer, if they, especially if they recently arrived. Uh, I'd like to share some stories. Um, I, I have some clients who have crossed the border in the recent years. Um, I have a client who came to the US to plead asylum. She's a single mom of five and was brutally attacked due to gang violence in her area. After making this difficult trip from Southern Mexico, her and her five kids waited on the bridge to declare themselves at the border and plead asylum in the hot sun for 36 hours without any access to food or water. From there, once admitted, she was strip searched in front of her children, including her 15 year old son. Their documents such as passport and birth certificates were taken from them by immigration, never to be seen again, which, which normally um, is what happens, unfortunately. Um, from there, they were put into a holding cell uh, called a yelera or ice box in English. The holding cell is intentionally kept ice cold and the fluorescent lights stay on all day and all night. She was separated from her eldest son for a week. When she was finally let free, she got an ankle monitor. No one told her that she needed to plea asylum within a year. She was given many papers in English and that served as instructions, but did not know how to read very well, especially not in English. Another client who came in pregnant uh, with her partner uh, to the border to plead asylum um, because a family member was killed in gang violence uh, and they were directly threatened. From there, they were separated. She was released not too long after, but her partner stayed detained for over six months. Eventually, uh, she stopped hearing from him. And to this day, um, we have no idea where he is. Um, she has no idea where he is either. He has never met his child or held him in his arms. So every day we hear more and more of these uh, stories of abuse, negligence, and violence uh, that the Border Patrol, ICE, and the US government impacts on people seeking asylum. We have heard about the cruel policy of separating kids from their families, of keeping people detained for years, of solitary confinement, sexual abuse by border patrol agents, child abuse, and psychological warfare. Um, clients and immigrants at the border are here fleeing war, violence, domestic violence, chronic poverty, starvation, and seeking access to medical treatment and a better life for their families. And US foreign policy is largely responsible for destabilizing governments in Central and South America. And our government's response is to torture people and put them into a criminal system that dehumanizes them. Uh, even though once they leave the border without documents, uh, they have no choice but to enter the economy um, illegally to be able to survive and hopefully hire a lawyer to plead their asylum case. Even then, the likelihood of winning their case is low, as low as 26% of a asylum cases are approved by judges, and the number is lower for judges appointed recently under Trump's administration. Um, providing the ser uh, these services for clients who have gone through tremendous tra trauma at the hands of this cruel system is very difficult. Uh, for clients who have done everything right, never broken the law, it's hard for them to understand why they must exist with an ankle monitor tracking their every move. It's hard for people to understand that they could follow all the laws, go through all their court check-ins and ICE reporting and still be deported. Um, I'm, I'm personally motivated to do this work because I know another world is possible. I believe that immigrants should be welcomed into this country and be treated with dignity and have access to what they need to survive and thrive rather than the current system of dehumanization and criminalization. Um, as, we, as we know, um, uh, ICE and Border Patrol operations didn't exist before 2003. Um, if we lived without these systems before, um, I think we can definitely create a reality without these systems now. Um, through both our, uh, our case management program at IRIS and our involvement with the CCIF, Connecticut Coalition for Freedom, uh, Co Connecticut Coalition for Immigrant Freedom, uh, we have been able to be solutions oriented in our work. Attorneys at both IRIS and our partner in New Haven Legal Assistance have been able to help families going through deportation navigate the system. Uh, and provide high quality and free legal representation for people detained. It is a constant challenge as these systems were not made to be accessible for black and brown people. Uh, this is life-changing opportunity for immigrants in our community and we need to support uh, them by making sure that people know about this project and making sure that it is um, funded. And that's, thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela. I really appreciate you sharing and, and for your vulnerability. 
Um, so we are at 240 folks, and that means that you can start putting uh, questions in the chat. Um, you can either send it to Anne, to Zini, or to me, and we will um, pull them and ask questions to our wonderful panelists. So we have a couple so far, and um, I actually have a question for you, Kika, if you're up for it. Um, so the first question is, why did Biden allow the deportations recently, just like Trump? Yeah, so what happened was uh, the uh, right after the elections, um, their advocates quickly moved to make sure that the their demands were heard. And one of their demands was a moratorium on deportations. Um, people felt that the administration needed to hit the pause button and try to move forward uh, with undoing the anti-immigrant executive orders um, and moving forward policies that were more humane. Um, and so the Biden administration actually moved forward with that, with that recommendation and announced that there was going to be a 100-day moratorium on deportations. And fortunately, it was challenged in court, and a Texas judge reversed the moratorium on deportation, and ICE carried out uh, as though it was it were business as usual and moved forward with a series of very disturbing uh, deportations that again, if, if, if it's one thing that I want to highlight is how many people of color were affected. Plain loads of people from um, the Caribbean, particularly Jamaicans, uh, and Black people from the African continent. Um, that is why we saw the deportations continue as though it were business as usual. Um, now I'm happy to say that there have been a number of reversals of executive orders that will move forward under Trump, including the executive order that made it possible to deport um, anybody who had no status. So right now there is a very clear criteria uh, for deportation um, uh, uh, that really gives relief for people who live in this country who don't have status and are minding their own business and um, taking care of their families. Thanks, Kika. Attorney General Tong, we have a question that is, what are the biggest hurdles to getting legal representation for people seeking asylum? What are, well, it, let me um, first uh, pick up, let me answer that question in a second, but let me pick up on, on what Kika said about um, the action by, unfortunately, my colleague, the Texas Attorney General, um, to stop President Biden from from a 100-day moratorium on um, deportations. And uh, this is the same attorney general who went to the Supreme Court and tried to overturn the presidential election. And so this is just a window into how state attorneys general every day, we work together sometimes, and but we're often um, arrayed against each other too, particularly on these big issues. And over the past four years, you know, on a number of critical immigration questions. It was state attorneys general, like the Muslim ban, the public charge rule, the census question, the separation policy, um, um, the building of the border wall. All of those were fights that 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 I was in or, or before me, George Jepson was in. We were lucky that we were successful in a number of those, not all of them. Um, but what it underscores is that these legal fights continue, even though we change presidents and don't expect, no one should expect that we're just going to snap a finger and it's going to go back either to the way that it was, which may not have been great either, um, or that we're going to snap a finger and have this miraculous, just and equitable and fair system. Um, and for the lawyers on the call, you know, for people whose eyes glaze over when we start talking about the federal administrative rulemaking process in administrative law, guess what? That's like the most important forum right now for a lot of these fights. And, and that's where um, a lot of my lawyers spend their days in, in front of federal agencies and in the rulemaking process. And because the Trump administration forced through um, and press through so many rural changes, not just on immigration, but on the environment and so many other areas. Um, those rules now have to be undone. And that's a long process and a difficult process. And so it's gonna be a long slog for all of us. So in many ways, 
you know, God bless, we have a new administration, but the work is just beginning in, in so many respects. Um, Tabitha, I'm sorry, I lost your original question. What was your original question? That's okay, no problem, no problem. So the question is, um, what are the biggest hurdles to getting legal representation for people seeking asylum? So resources, number one, um, you know, Chris mentioned how because it's not technically a criminal proceeding, you don't get a public defender. And we've heard this, the, the horror stories of kids, infants, toddlers going before uh, immigration judges and, and their disposition being adjudicated by an immigration judge um, with the full power and weight of the federal government on one side and a baby on the other side without any effective help representation. I can't, I can't fathom or imagine anything more unjust than that. Um, and so there's no effective system for providing representation and legal counsel as Chris and Kika both observed. Um, there's no real system at the state level either. And um, some of you may know, I'm asking the legislature to give me civil rights authority, which surprisingly Connecticut, uh, Connecticut's attorney general does not have um, by statute. That will help, but I won't have the opportunity or um, the resources or the authority to represent individuals. Um, I act in the name of the state of Connecticut and, and where the state's interests are at stake. So it's really important to be honest about it. It's about money, it's about resources, it's about commitment and making sure as we do, you know, a $2 trillion uh, COVID stimulus bill and between a two and $4 trillion infrastructure plan, um, we need to ask our, our federal leaders, um, including people of my own party, you need to, you need to spend money and resources on the, the immigration crisis. And if you do comprehensive immigration reform, which we hope that you will, that you fund comprehensive immigration reform and that you provide the resources necessary to do fair immigration and immigration policy in this country. Great. Thank you so much, Attorney General Tong. Um, we have a, a question for Chris. Um, and folks are wondering about if it's possible for Connecticut families to foster um, unaccompanied minors until their case is resolved. Uh, good. Um, in the Tong tradition, I'm going to contribute to the previous, the answering the previous question <laughs> before I answer the one you've just given me, Tabitha. Um, so uh, yes, we desperately need to provide uh, representation for immigrants who are being deported. And uh, what, what the nonprofit groups that are scraping together our limited resources are hoping to do in the next few months is to actually ask state government, to ask the state of Connecticut to allocate funds from its budget to pay for universal representation uh, of uh, immigrants and deportation hearings. In other words, apply that very American principle that you know, no matter what the person has been charged with, they should have an attorney. Apply that to immigration court. Someone is being deported, they should have an attorney. And we're just asking you for money. We will work with the other legal aid groups in the state to hire attorneys and to put this together. We just need funding from the government and we think it should be government funded. And you know, you'd be joining a few other states that have taken this step and be setting an example for uh, the nation, uh, which I know is something Connecticut would like to do. So you'll hear about that in the future. If you wanna become a foster parent and welcome uh, an unaccompanied child to your home, it is a long process um, of training, of working with DCF, of um, undergoing background checks. So you can't just say, you know, I've got a spare bedroom in my house I'd like to take an unaccompanied child from the border. And you know, let's be honest, placing a child from Central America with a foster parent is really a last resort. Placing them in a shelter in Connecticut, it is a last resort. 
They should be placed with friends or relatives. We have to speed up that process of identifying and vetting sponsors for these kids. Right now, you've got 500 kids a day coming into the shelters at the border, and you've got only about 250 going out. So do the math. That's why they're piling up. Thank you, Chris. Great, so we have a question for Daniela, and um, we actually have two, but I'm gonna do one first. Um, and it is, how are we to provide health, mental health, addiction, and dental care resources for undocumented immigrants? And that's for Daniela. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I'm sorry, it just, you got, kind of got cut off. Yeah. Sure, no problem. I'll repeat. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. So it's, um, how are we to provide health, mental health, addiction, and dental care resources for undocumented immigrants? Okay, thank you. So currently um, there are a few healthcare options for immigrants. Uh, uninsured immigrants in the community rely heavily on clinics and emergency services, ultimately overloading these systems. Um, this is a major public health issue, especially during COVID. Uh, clients have been waiting months with serious health issues before speaking to a doctor. Um, I, I'd like to mention the Husky for Immigrants um, campaign. With, um, it's to expand uh, Husky to include all residents of Connecticut uh, regardless of immigration status, um, it's Bill SB 956. Um, we, have a, we have been involved in this campaign and could use the support. Uh, everyone on this call, um, I invite you to participate in this campaign and also contact your legislator asking them to support SB 956. Um, tomorrow, um, actually, so tomorrow, um, April 1st, uh, the Human Services Committee will meet on this and it'll be the last time this year that they will have a chance to vote on SB 956 um, out of committee. Um, and I, so, yeah. Great, thank you, Daniela. Um, okay, so I see it's already 2.52, so we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Um, and so the next thing that I have um, is for Chris, and uh, Chris, maybe you can tag team this with Kika and um, Attorney General Tong, but the question is, um, how is an annual number of immigrants, sorry, fire truck is passing. <laughs> One sec. Okay, how is an annual number of immigrants um, that can be safely and reasonably accommodated in the United States determined? Wow, so um, complicated question. Um, there are so many factors. And uh, if you just sort of look, just by way of comparison at the refugee resettlement program, and again, refugees make up a tiny, tiny fraction, of the total number of immigrants coming to the country. Um, but that is government regulated. And each, uh, each state um, uh, will uh, determine with refugee resettlement agencies uh, what the capacity is. Uh, they'll look at things like uh, employment. Uh, they'll look at things at uh, services for refugees. Now, in the case of immigrants, um, you know, there is almost unlimited capacity um, and you also need to look at need. I mean, immigrants are, are in most cases working, providing important services, are an essential part of the economy. Our economy needs immigrants to be coming in you know, ultimately, it's a question that's going to be hammered out by Congress. Congress might kick back some of the decision making to state legislatures, but I'd love help from Kika or from uh, Attorney General uh, yeah. Tong on so, answering this question. It's okay, I'll, I'll jump in. And um, let me just say, first of all, totally agree, Chris. Um, let's be honest, this country runs on immigrant labor, always has. And um, um, frankly, the story of, of Chinese immigration to build the transcontinental railroad 
post-slavery, by the way, is about immigrant labor and needing those people who essentially worked as indentured servants to build this country up. And it's still true today. And you just can't take 12 million plus people and pull them out of the American economy and hope to survive, period. So um, it, it, it's incredibly important to recognize that. And so that fact should suggest the answer, which is it depends, right? It depends on what we need and what the country demands um, um, principally because of what our economy demands, but a, a variety of other reasons. And so the better inquiry is not, you know, what's the number because that's a, it's almost an absurd question. The better question is, do we have a fair process for managing a system that is free from hate and racism and xenophobia and that honors our legal obligation to hear people and their claims when they come to us and they say, I am at risk, please help me. That's a legal obligation, by the way. Under federal law, if somebody says to us, the United States of America, I am running for my life and I'm gonna die unless you help me, please help me, we have an obligation to hear them. And if they, have a, if they present a valid claim to protect them, and we have turned our back on people now for too long, um, particularly under President Trump. And we have to develop a system that administers that legal obligation and our larger obligation to immigrants to do so in a way that recognizes and acknowledges their humanity, right? And does the best they can, the best that we can for them, their families and all the families that are already here. The only thing I would add is I do think we need a radical reimagining of what our immigration system should look like and it should be based on principles of justice uh, and humanity and everything else that Attorney General Tong and Chris said. Um, I also um, want to lift up something I said earlier, which is that our system is so broken and, that, and, and our, this issue is so partisan that we have not had any significant changes in the law since 1996, that is immoral, right? Given the crisis that we have. And then I, I, I would also add, you know, we also need, it, it's, it's not just about uh, the question of how we set up the structure, but how we fix the problem of 12 million plus undocumented immigrants who like Attorney General Tong said, right? On whose back we survive and thrive and profit from, and who are subject to degrading and inhumane treatment um, uh, every single uh, day, including and particularly under the pandemic. Thank you so much, Kika. Um, so Attorney General Tong has to leave. And so I just wanted to give him a chance to, um, to say goodbye to everyone. So, uh Thank you, everybody, and, and thank you for participating, and thank you for your work and, and your advocacy. And let me just say, um, I, I'm sure that, that many people are wondering, what can we do? You can do so many things, right? Advocate for um, the, the Husky Bill and, and call your congressmen and senators and, and push them, but be there for people in your community. That's my plea to you. When somebody in your community is under attack and has been unfairly targeted, by an unjust immigration system, support them, fight for them. That's what we can do. Thank you, everybody. See you. Thanks again, Attorney General Tong. And uh, I, I will say amen to that. Um, well, you know what? It's 2.59 and um, just let's have some a closing remark from Kika because um, she also has to leave. And Kika, can you also speak to what it is that the average person can do to help in this fight? Get involved, get involved at the local level, take up Daniela's suggestion in the chat box, um, get involved with the federal efforts that are happening now. There are a coalition of national organizations that are working closely with localities to push for changes in the immigration laws. When you hear about an immigrant in your neighborhood in crisis uh, and fearing deportation, get involved. It's gonna take an entire village for us to get to justice on this issue. Thanks again for being here, Kika. We so appreciate you and are so honored to have you on our board. I just want to say that on a personal level. 
Vaikika. Okay. Um, Daniela, um, I know you said, is Daniela still here? Yes. I know you said that, um, you know, you gave a suggestion for what we can do with uh, Huskies for Immigration, for instance. Is there anything else that you would like um, to suggest to folks who want to help? Yeah, um, so uh, going off of what um, Attorney General Tom said and Kika, um, yeah, we, we need to continue to push for immigrant rights and, and follow the um, follow our undocumented members in our community who are leading this um, all these uh, fights and campaigns, supporting campaigns um, so that we can help elevate the voices of our immigrant neighbors. Um, so there, right now, yeah, for example, there's the Husky campaign, but I'm sure there will be many more other other campaigns that we can support. Um, yeah. Thank you, Daniela. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank um, you. Could you tell everyone goodbye for us? Uh, Are you there? Yes. Yes, Chris. Can you tell us goodbye? Oh, We're, sure. Um, yeah, I missed that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, final words from me. Um, Put yourself in the shoes of the people from Central America who are coming to this country. Imagine you're a parent of some children who've been threatened by gangs. Maybe you've lost your spouse. Your only recourse is to take matters into your own hands and try to find a place where you can have a life. Learn more about this topic. Learn more by organizing events, big and small, around films, around books, around a speaker. Iris can help you do that. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Attorney General Tong. Thank you, Kika Matos. Thank you, Daniela uh, Caranda. And thank you to Zini and Tabitha and Ann O'Brien for organizing this. Thank you all for participating. Thanks everyone. And thanks again to W uh, H oh my God, W S H U Public Radio. We're so um, we're so happy to have all of you here. And we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day.